Good evening. Hong Kong was rattled by a rare earthquake earlier tonight. No damage has been reported, but the tremor, measuring 3.5 on the Richter scale, was widely felt across the city. ATV's Mary Lloyd reports. It's something that hardly ever happens in Hong Kong, and it took many by surprise. The quake shook the city at 7.58 p.m., and the observatory and local radio stations were flooded with phone calls from residents who were alarmed, concerned, or just curious about what had happened. There were no reports of damage or injuries, but in some village areas, residents ran out into the streets. The observatory says the quake, measuring 3.5 on the Richter scale, was centered in the sea about 36 kilometers southeast of Hong Kong. The last earthquake to hit Hong Kong was in October 2004. For all the earth tremors felt in Hong Kong, um, most cases uh, were of intensity uh, from 2 to 4. So uh, this is uh, uh, one of the, uh, it's, it's about the same as, as uh, those uh, recorded. The last significant quake to hit Hong Kong was a magnitude 5 tremor in 1994. Mary Lloyd, ATV News. There was a stinging report today sharply criticizing the government for letting the mid-levels area turn into a concrete jungle. The Ombudsman, which investigates complaints against government departments, accused officials of allowing too much development there over the past 30 years, leading to overcrowding and traffic congestion. ATV's Arthur O'Kella reports. Mid-Levels has changed drastically over the last three decades, as expatriates and local residents alike, looking for upmarket homes, settled down in the area. But should the government have allowed so much development there? No, says the Ombudsman's office, which investigates complaints against government departments. This is a rather unusual case. In 1972, the government decided to restrict building development in the area, using a so-called administrative moratorium to control the population and ease traffic congestion, a long-standing problem. But more than three decades later, there's been a big surge in the number of people living there, and congestion has become worse. The ombudsman found that the moratorium was badly planned and implemented, citing poor coordination between the government departments involved, and accused the lands department of being too liberal in allowing rampant development. In cases that we are aware of, we believe that um, sometimes discretion have been used to remove certain height restrictions. Um, so that, in effect, would be a liberal, liberalization. What happened, in effect, was that the Lands Department frequently lifted height restrictions, allowing developers to cram more flats into the already built-up area. The Ombudsman cited one case in which the Lands Department removed a 35-foot height restriction on a site which also allowed one 10-story building on top of a car park. The site ended up having two 10-story towers over a three-story car park. The investigation focused on the mid-levels area, but it could have much wider implications. The fear now is that other government departments could be bending the rules. Government carries on. Restructuring, if you've got a government Restructuring is inevitable. Therefore, what happened 30 years ago and in the course of the 30 years could well happen again. And as we know, it does happen. The government today strongly denied the Lands Department had been too liberal, saying the moratorium only applied to existing leases and was never intended to restrict development as a whole. Arthur Akula, ATV News. The government has been accused of putting swimmers' safety at risk by failing to alert the public about the discovery of two dead sharks at Sheko Beach last month. Officials have rejected the claims. ATV's Edna Tse reports. The shark carcasses were found two weeks ago outside the netted area that protects swimmers here at the Sheko Beach. They're believed to be the type known as silky sharks, measuring 80 to 90 centimeters. They were found by a contractor of the Leisure and Cultural Services Department, which looks after public beaches during an inspection of the shark prevention nets. Democratic Party lawmaker Fred Lee accused the department and his contractor of putting swimmers' lives at risk by waiting until last night to announce the discovery. I think they should be held accountable and once the LCSD receive the report and they are not notifying the public, a lot of swimmers going to, the, to Shek O. Oh, Shek O oh is a very popular one. But the department claims it was only told about the sharks earlier this week by the contractor, which is responsible for checking the nets. By this incident, we uh, have uh, room for improvement, uh, such as uh, 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 the immediate reporting 
uh, requirement. Even the contractor uh, find the uh, dead body of shark. Marine biologist Andy Cornish says silky sharks are not considered dangerous to humans. This shark is quite common in other parts of the world. All right, but as far as I can work out, they've never been, they've never actually killed a person. He advised swimmers to stay calm if they see a shark and slowly get out of the water. Swimmers at the beach today said they were not worried about sharks at all. The government has decided there's no need to raise an alert at the beach, as it has not found any sign of more sharks there. Edna Zay, ATV News. The Privacy Commissioner has launched an investigation into a website that reveals the addresses of some of Hong Kong's top celebrities. A local newspaper says it's been able to verify up to 70% of the addresses on the list. ATV's Anne-Marie Sim reports. You can find most anything on the internet, and now that includes the addresses of your favorite celebrities. Local internet forum discuss.com.hk posted the addresses of dozens of Hong Kong's biggest names, including Kando pop singers Leon Lai, and Miriam Young, whose exact building name and street they live on are on the site. For stars such as Andy Lau and Jackie Chan, only the general area they live in has been revealed. The Privacy Commissioner is now looking into whether the website has broken any privacy laws. Chinese language newspaper Ming Pao Daily claims it's been able to verify 60 to 70 percent of the addresses on the list. Celebrity privacy has been hitting the headlines lately with the publication of photos in Easy Finder magazine of twin singer Gillian Chung undressing backstage at a concert which were taken with a hidden camera. Jackie Chan led a protest last month to the government headquarters condemning the photos as a violation of professional ethics. A massive campaign to oust Taiwan President Chen Shui-bian is heading for a climax tomorrow when half a million protesters are expected to surround the presidential palace at night to demand his resignation. Labour unions are planning to top that by causing chaos at the island's busiest airport. There's a political typhoon battering down his door, but Chen Shui-bian is making it look like he's got bigger fish to fry. Speaking by video conference from Taipei to a group of academics, supporters and reporters in New York, Chen said that after being rejected for UN membership for 14 years in a row as the Republic of China, the island will apply next time as Taiwan. He admitted that the new tactic was hardly likely to succeed, but pointed out that applying for UN membership under the name Taiwan would prevent the issue from becoming stuck over the one-China policy. All that doesn't matter to the anti-Chen protesters in Taipei, keeping vigil outside the presidential palace for a sixth straight day. They just want him to get out. They were out in force again today, chanting slogans and flashing that trademark thumbs-down signal for Chen to step down over corruption allegations involving his family members and inner circle. The round-the-clock campaign is heading for a climax on Friday night when half a million protesters are expected to hit the streets and hold a flashlight rally around the presidential palace. The man who is leading the campaign, Xi Mingte, the former chairman of Chen's ruling Democratic Progressive Party, has promised to carry on until the president is forced to quit. There's no telling if Xi and his supporters will be able to keep up the enthusiasm and momentum of the past week, but it looks like there's more drama ahead with labor unions planning to cause chaos on the roads to and from Taiwan's busiest airport. Unionists say they will mobilize thousands of taxis, tourist buses and other vehicles to circle the Taiwan Taoyuan International Airport and paralyze its operations by occupying its access roads. The aim is to make the anti-Chen protests attract international attention. Canada is reeling from the shock after a lone gunman opened fire on students at a college campus in Montreal killing one and wounding 19 others. The gunman was identified as 25-year-old Kim Veer Gill, who liked to play a computer game about the Columbine High School shootings in 1999. ATV's Tony Saban reports. Hundreds of terrified students and staff ran for cover outside Dawson College in Montreal after a lone gunman walked onto the campus and opened fire with an automatic rifle. Officials say one person died while 19 others were wounded in the shooting before police arrived at the scene and shot the suspect dead. Policemen uh, on the scene take a good decision because uh, um, they, uh, the way they act, they save life. Witnesses say the suspect was a man of South Asian descent who was dressed in a black trench coat and had a mohawk. 
Afterwards, authorities sealed off the area and evacuated several buildings nearby. Shell-shocked students hugged each other for support and were thankful to be alive. I was in the atrium, I was eating my lunch, and uh, the guy came from the entrance and he started shooting people. And like we jumped on the floor. The police were there. There was two policemen right on the scene, like when he shot the three shots, telling him to drop his weapon. Emergency services rushed the wounded to Montreal General Hospital, where several were in critical condition. The Montreal General Hospital Emergency Service has admitted 11 patients of the shooting incident at Dawson. Six patients, uh, sorry, eight patients are in critical condition. Authorities say they don't know what caused the man to go on a shooting rampage, but have ruled out terrorism or racist motives. Canada's Prime Minister Stephen Harper described it as a cowardly and senseless act of violence, while Quebec's Premier Jean Charest said he was distressed by the incident. The shooting recalled grim memories of the so-called Montreal massacre of December 6, 1989, when a lone gunman killed 14 female students at an engineering college before killing himself. Tony Sabine, ATV News. UN Secretary General Kofi Annan has declared the US-led invasion of Iraq a real disaster after touring the region and meeting its leaders. But he said the US should not pull out just yet. ATV's Nick Waters reports. UN Secretary General Kofi Annan was opposed to the Iraq invasion from the start and two and a half years on his views have not changed. Most of the leaders I spoke to felt uh, Iraq, the invasion of Iraq and its aftermath has been uh, a, a real disaster uh, for them. They believe it has destabilized uh, the region. Anan, who has just returned from a trip to the Middle East, said the U.S. withdrawal from Iraq was now a key issue. The timing has to be optimum and um, uh, it has to be arranged in such a way that it, it, it does not lead to even greater uh, disruption or violence in the region. Baghdad's Shiite neighborhood of al Huria came under attack today. An explosives-laden car blew up this morning, killing at least one person and injuring a dozen more. Yesterday, police recovered more than 60 bodies riddled with bullets from across the capital. The U.S. government has acknowledged sectarian violence in the country, Iraqis killing Iraqis, but again rejected Anand's criticism of the war. The White House said it was spreading democracy in the Middle East and not creating a disaster for the region. Thousands of South Korean riot police have clashed with residents of a town south of Seoul where 90 homes have been torn down to make way for a new U.S. military base. Mary Lloyd has more. Demolition workers made quick work of houses in Dayachuri, a village outside Pyeongtaek city about 65 kilometers south of Seoul. While up on the rooftops, residents made their last stand in a battle against the demolition order that has been raging for months. Protesters were evicted from the village by force in May by the South Korean government, but more than 220 residents had remained in some of the houses. This land is our land, read the banner these demonstrators draped on their roof. The South Korean government disagrees and has said the land can be used to expand a nearby U.S. military base so that the main base in Seoul can be closed and U.S. troops can be moved to the enlarged site. South Korean Prime Minister Han Myung-suk said the demolition was unavoidable if the U.S. military was to relocate and ordered officials to go ahead with the leveling but to make sure residents were kept safe. More than 10,000 riot police were called in to ensure demolition workers could get the job done. And there were clashes with protesters and anti-US demonstrators. 23 activists were arrested after trying to break through a police barricade across the road leading to the village. Residents were offered financial compensation to move from the site, but still objected to the plans. The U.S. military is planning to move its South Korean headquarters from Seoul to Pyeongtaek by 2008 as it consolidates its forces and cuts the number of its troops there. About 30,000 troops are currently stationed in South Korea. This will be cut to about 25,000 as the U.S. reportedly sets up a more high-tech rapid reaction force which will be better equipped to respond to possible aggression from North Korea. Mary Lloyd, ATV News. Time now for sports. We start with Champions League action from Europe and Asia, where China's Shanghai Shenhua faced a tricky quarterfinal test against a team from South Korea. ATV's Mel Nihanetka reports. The two-leg knockout stages in the AFC Champions League got underway after a break for the World Cup, with Shanghai Shenhua holding on for a slim 1-0 victory over South Korea's Junbuk. 
Gal Lin scored the lone goal in the first half as June Book were reduced to nine men after Kim Young Bum and Body picked up red cards. The Korean team will be looking to exact revenge when the teams meet again in the second leg next Wednesday. In the European Champions League, despite the return of former coach Fabio Capello and more big-name signings, Real Madrid looks no closer to turning around its slump as the squad tumbled at Lyon 2-0. The two-time champion, Manchester United, edged Celtic 3-2 in an entertaining game at Old Trafford. The result put rivals Arsenal in first place in Group F because FC Copenhagen and Benfica drew 0-0. Arsenal, last season's runner-up, began its campaign with a 2-1 win at Hamburg SV despite the absence of the injured Thierry Henry. Filippo Inzaghi and Kaka each scored as six-time European champion AC Milan blanked AEK Athens 3-0. French national coach Raymond Domenech regrets not replacing Zinedine Zidane during the crucial World Cup final match. Speaking at a FIFA symposium, Domenech said he would have taken Zidane out of the match 11 minutes earlier when asked what he would have done differently in the final. Zidane infamously headbutted Marco Materazzi after the Italian defender made derogatory remarks about his sister in the game. In other sports news, Germany and Spain have booked their spots in the semifinals of the men's field hockey World Cup championship but not without some controversy. Germany and South Korea were jeered by fans of Germany as they engineered a scoreless draw, allowing both teams to advance to the semifinals of the Men's Hockey World Cup. If either team had lost, they would have faced elimination on goal difference by the Netherlands on the final day of group matches. Australian leg spinner Shane Warren had a 37th birthday he would rather forget after being struck in the head by a delivery while batting in England. The Hampshire captain was hit above the eye by a ball bowled by countryman Matt Mason in a limited overs game against Worcestershire. Warner was hit above his right eye and had to have stitches to close the gash. For players on the PGA Tour, they compete each week for million-dollar checks, silver trophies and green jackets. But for the young golfers who competed at the We Wonders Open Golf Championships, their top prize was meeting the world number one. It was a dream come true for eight young up-and-coming golfers who got some tips from Tiger Woods, who took time out from his pro-am duties to teach the future PGAers how to putt, chip, and send a drive down the middle of the fairway. Tonight's winning mark six numbers. 12, 26, 27, 28, 32, 46, and the extra number is 47. The weather forecast for the next few days, sunny intervals and a few showers tomorrow with a top temperature of 29 degrees. More of the same over the weekend and the rain will continue into next week. Now the weather around the world.